Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. Our topic is Rome. We have discussed in previous lectures the early peoples that lived on the Italian peninsula. For example, the Etruscans, um, the Greeks, of course, living in southern, the southern part of the Italian peninsula. We've uh, also discussed the Roman monarchy and the early republic. Well, to le today's lecture, we'll talk about the late Republic, uh, roughly about the years 133 um, B.C. to 31 B.C. Now, the late Republic, as you'll find out, was a time of conflict. Uh, we have the very famous uh, Spartacus slave revolt that Hollywood seems to love, at least in previous years. They, there were a lot of movies made about this uh, where, of course, uh, when Rome went through its stage of imperialism, we're going to find that slavery increases within the Roman Empire. And uh, the small farmers, the backbone, uh, not of the Roman Empire, but of the Roman Republic, we're yet not yet an empire, um, the small farmers will start to dwindle and uh, slavery increases. And of course, we have um, these very famous, this very famous slave revolt that occurred during the late Republic, led by a very famous figure in history named Spartacus. Now, it was unsuccessful. This slave revolt was put down. In fact, a common execution method for um, slaves um, in Roman history was crucifixion. They would line um, the crosses up on the road leading to Rome and, and crucify these slaves. And it was a warning to others in uh, Rome, of course, not to do the same thing. So eventually was put down, but caused a lot of chaos within Rome um, during this time. Now, we know that the Senate, and the Senate is still in power in Rome, and it has gained power actually, during the late Republic. We also have a, another group of people that will uh, come to some prominence here. They're called the equestrians. They're more of uh, like tax collectors and businessmen um, that served in the Roman cavalry, hence the name equestrian. Uh, we'll see a few of these uh, very famous equestrians come to power in Rome as well during this late Republic. And, of course, the chaos of the time will help some of these men gain power. Uh, very uh, famous, some of the very famous leaders in Rome during this time period, we have, they're called the Gracchi brothers. We have Tiberius Gracchus, who had wanted to, to do something to, uh, to help the small farmers. He felt that the underlying cause of Rome's trouble was the decline of the small farmers. And so basically he wanted to uh, propose a land law that would restrict people. Uh, they could only ho hold like 300 acres per citizen. Um, so it was very specific about how, mu how much land you could actually have. You couldn't have like 1,000 acres. And of course, what if you already had more land than this? Well, according to Tiberius Gracchus, what he would do is all of the excess land would be taken from you and distributed to the poor. Now, I'm sure some people were very excited about this, but I'm sure a lot of these senators, um, of course, who were the wealthy segment in Roman society were not extremely happy about this. In fact, of course, um, Tiberius will end up being murdered and his body will be thrown into the Tiber River. Uh, the same fate, obviously, um, his brother, when his brother follows him into power, uh, a little bit later, but when he comes to power, his name was Gaius Gracchus, he will also um, try to make laws to benefit the poor and he meets the same fate as his older brother. He is murdered as well. And so we're starting to see here in Roman history a willingness to resort to assassination, which only opens the door for more instability and more violence um, throughout Rome. 
Of course, we have some military leaders that, that take power, as you can imagine. Um, you needed to be a very strong leader with the backing of, of an army would help, obviously. Um, men like Marius um, comes to power in Rome around 107 BC, a, a basic time frame here. And he does something that hasn't been done before. Marius actually recruits volunteers from both the urban and the rural people who possessed no property. Um, shocking, of course, but it hadn't been done before. Traditionally, the Roman army was an army of small landholders. Well, of course, now these volunteers, they're going to get paid, they serve in the army, will not swear an oath of loyalty to the Senate. They will swear an oath of loyalty to Marius, the general, of course. And in return, this general, at the time it was Marius, will promise them land when they retire from the army, um, they, according to Marius, would get land. So now we're going to start seeing these generals playing politics because the Senate still has to approve all of this eventually. Um, this new army could prove to be very dangerous. Um, it could even destroy the Republic, as we'll find out. We have other leaders that come to power, of course, by the, uh, one man, another commander, military by the name of Sulla. We'll have a civil war between Marius and Sulla at the time, um, which also isn't healthy for the Roman Republic. And we'll have the first triumvirate come to power, the very famous first triumvirate with men like Pompey and Crassus and, of course, probably the most famous Julius Caesar. These three men will make an alliance. They will obtain power. Of course, with three very powerful individuals, um, their friendship, their alliance, so to speak, did not last. And we'll start to see uh, fighting between Pompey and Julius Caesar. Um, the very famous when Julius Caesar's coming back from Gaul, which is modern day France, um, and he uh, has the Rubicon River. And Julius Caesar had been outlawed by the Senate because Pompey was in charge at the time. and According to the story, Julius Caesar plunges his horse into the Rubicon and, sa and says the die is cast. In other words, he can't turn back. His decision is irreversible. He will continue with his army marching on Rome. And, of course, uh, Pompey will end up having to flee. Uh, again, instability, chaos that results in this... Um, late Republic. Of course, I'm sure you'll hear a lot about Julius Caesar eventually with these lectures. Julius Caesar um, ends, uh, meets a very tragic end as well, uh, which is, will actually end the Republic um, with his death, but he is also assassinated, um, stabbed within the confines of Rome, which was just actually um, which was horrifying because the reason the Romans wore the togas inside the city walls because it was a peace garment. You weren't supposed to have any kind of daggers or any kind of weapons carried on your person if you were wearing a toga. So the very fact that some of these senators had these daggers as they were wearing their togas um, just actually speaks to um, where Rome has, has what, what Rome has become. But uh, Julius Caesar, of course, was assassinated um, on the Ides of March in 44 BC. So those are just a few of the, the people, the important people that um, were existing or around in the, the late Republic. So let's find out more about the late Republic. Last time, we looked at the expansion of the Roman Republic from its beginnings in 509 BC down to roughly 149 BC. Today I want to look at the difficult transition in Roman politics that took place roughly from where we left off last time down to the establishment of the Roman Empire under Augustus. From 146 to 133 BC, 
all of the problems that we talked about last time grew steadily worse. Then in 133 BC, a series of internal struggles broke out that gradually undermined the structure of the whole Roman state. The conflict was ignited by the action of two brothers named Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, uh, and, uh, who tried to remedy the problems that had arisen that we had talked about last time. These two men came from a very distinguished Roman uh, plebeian senatorial family. They were still anxious to solve the problems which had arisen at Rome in the previous century in spite of their membership in the noble class. Their chance first came in 133 BC when Tiberius Gracchus, the older brother, was elected to the office of Tribune of the Plebs. This office had originally been set up to protect the interests of the plebeian class, the lower class, and tribunes had the right to propose laws for the benefit of poorer Romans. Tiberius decided to use this power to solve two related problems that he believed would come to plague Rome if they were not fixed. Number one, over the previous 50 or so years, more and more small citizen farmers had lost their land and moved to the city. Since the Roman army was comprised of citizen farmer soldiers who could afford to buy their own gear, Tiberius realized that if this trend continued, soon there simply wouldn't be enough farmers, enough small farmers at any rate, to make up the legions. Rome, in effect, would run out of soldiers. So that's the first problem. Uh, Tiberius' worry that Rome is going to no longer be able to raise legions, no longer be able to raise armies. His second problem was that these citizen farmers, when they lost their farms, moved to the city of Rome. And in the city, they had no livelihood. Uh, <clears throat> what manufacturing work there was in the city was done by slaves, which meant that over the previous 50 years or so, Rome had created a, an, uh, um, an urban poverty problem and Tiberius wanted to do something to alleviate that urban poverty. Now, in order to solve these problems, Tiberius wanted to provide land to these displaced folks so that they could once again become productive citizen farmers. Uh, the Roman state had enormous tracts of public land in Italy, <clears throat> and Tiberius proposed to divide up some of this land into plots of about 20 acres that could be then used to settle the, the, the poor of the city of Rome on so that they could once again become productive citizens. Now this had been done in the past without any problems. There had been similar land reform in the past, but by 133 BC, many senators had rented or leased this public land from the government and were using it for themselves. And they had no desire to give it up. The law met with great resistance. Tiberius's land reform law met with great resistance in the Senate. And so Tiberius used his power as a tribune to take the measures directly, not to the Senate and Assembly, but to the Council of the Plebeians. The Council passed his law, and it created a commission to see that the land was divided up and handed out. But the Senate had to make funds available to the land commission, and the senators simply decided not to fund the law. Tiberius found out 
that the king of Pergamum, a king in Asia Minor, had died, and when he died, he had left his fortune to the Roman people. So Tiberius was able to get the council of the plebs to take the money from Asia and apply it to his grain reform. Again, he did an end run around the Senate, and the Senate was responsible for foreign policy, which of course this, 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 this Pergamum thing was. So Tiberius, uh, uh, Tiberius was able to use money that had been left to the city of Rome by the king of Pergamum when he died to fund his land reform. And as I'm sure you can guess, the Senate was absolutely furious at this when Tiberius Gracchus tried to run for a second term as tribune in 132, some senators and their clients rioted and killed Tiberius, assassinated him, and threw his body in the Tiber River. Well, after the death of Tiberius, there was peace in the city uh, for, for nearly 10 years, down to 123 BC, when Tiberius's brother Gaius became tribune. Now, Gaius Gracchus introduced many new reform measures which were intended to appeal to a much wider range of Roman citizens. He proposed more new land for the unemployed, but he also wanted to give political privileges to the equestrian class, that broad middle class that the Senate had been pushing out in the past. Some of the proposals passed, some didn't. Uh, this time, the Senate was much more cautious. They didn't take any immediate action. Gaius held the tribuneship for two years. After he had left office in 121, the Senate repealed all of his reforms. And when the Senate met to repeal those reforms, Riots broke out among the city plebs. The Senate accused Gaius of treason and used the army to kill him and many of his supporters. This action shows the true colors of the Senate. At this point, they are willing to use any means, constitutional or, in this case, illegal, to defeat reform and to maintain their own power over the state. The Senate's flagrant use of the army to support their monopoly of power created a precedent that at first protected the senatorial class, protected the nobiles, but ultimately would bring about their downfall and nearly tear Rome to pieces. It wouldn't be long before men appeared who were able to destroy the Senate's power over the army. The first of these men was named Gaius Marius. Now, Marius wasn't really a reformer, but he was unpopular with the Senate anyway because he didn't come from a distinguished family. He was not a member of a noble family. Uh, normally, he would not have had a chance to achieve high office, but in 107 BC, there was a war in North Africa, and the war had not been going well. Marius believed that he could win the war if he had the power to do so, and so <clears throat> he ran as consul on uh, an I can win the war ticket, if you will. Uh, he won the consulship in 107 BC and then he proceeded to try to raise an army. He believed he needed four, uh, four new legions to take to Africa to win the war in what I guess today we would call a surge. But the problem he had was he couldn't find enough soldiers to fight in his army. In fact, the thing that Tiberius Gracchus had feared had come to pass. There weren't enough farmer citizens to raise four legions, 
So Marius decided to go to the streets. He and his recruiters took to the streets of Rome. They offered poor Roman citizens an opportunity to fight in the army. Marius said he would provide the necessary equipment and weapons, and he promised these soldiers that after the war was over, they would receive land as bonuses. Well, Marius was able to raise six legions through this deal, and he took his legions to Africa. He won the war, and when he returned to Rome, he had six legions worth of men in the assembly, and they voted their own bonuses. What he had created, in effect, was a client army. He was their patron, they were his clients, and he could use them in the assembly to get what he wanted, and they could use the assembly to get what they wanted. <coughs> Marius used his clients to achieve a consulship, five more, or four more consulships, I should say four more, in 104, 103, 102, and 101. He served four consecutive consulships. From this time on, Roman armies were more loyal to their generals than they were to the Senate or to the Roman state. So Marius made the army a force in politics that it had never been before, and it wouldn't be long before somebody would use that army, use that power to take over the government itself. That man was Cornelius Sulla. Uh, now, Sulla was a Roman from a good family. He was a nobile, as it were. Uh, he supported the Senate in his politics. Uh, he was made uh, he, he uh, was made a general in 88 BC after one year as consul, and he was <coughs> sent to Asia. Asia Minor, really, to fight a war. Now, this war was in, in the wealthy East, so it was going to be a very lucrative position. Now, Sulla left Rome with his army to go down to the, the port of Ostia so his, trips, his troops could ship out to the war. <clears throat> and while he was gone, after he had arrived in Ostia, the Marian faction, the supporters of Marius in the assembly, fired him. They fired Sulla and they hired Marius, now in his 80s, to take the army uh, to the east. Well, Sulla would not have that. He brought his army together, he marched on the city of Rome itself, and he took the city and he purged as many members of the Marian faction as he could, and then he left and fought his war in the east. When he returned, he used his army to retake the city, and he made himself dictator for life in order to enact a series of reforms that would place the Senate firmly in power over the Roman state. He was the first general to turn his army against the government of Rome, but he sure wouldn't be the last. Now, in the years between 200 and 79 BC, Roman Republican government of magistrates, assembly, and senate rapidly declined and moved toward total destruction. The Senate has to take a large part of the blame for this development. They were much too arrogant, much too selfish to solve the social and economic problems confronting Rome. The Senate came to the point by the 70s, or actually by the, by the turn of the, of the first century, they came to the point that they would oppose any kind of reform by whatever means necessary. Marius and Sulla 
created a new wrinkle, if you will, in the problems of the Roman state, and this new wrinkle was the client army. An important, powerful, ambitious general could create an army that was more loyal to him than it was to Rome itself, and they could use that army to take control of the state. We might say that after Sulla, it was only a matter of time before a general would come along with enough support among the Roman armies to, to become essentially a dictator, a, a tyrant for life. Now, the first great military leader after Sulla was a man named Pompey the Great. He gave, he gave himself that nickname, the Great. Um, he had been an, a subordinate to Sulla, one of Sulla's officers. In the 70s and 60s, in the 70s and 60s, Pompey served one consulship, and then he held a whole series of very important provincial governorships, very important proconsular positions, provincial governorships. The Senate didn't really like him very much uh, because he didn't come from a noble family. But Pompey was very popular with the lower classes, and in his military commands, he was able to win the support of an enormous client following. At several points before 60 BC, Pompey was in a position to seize control of the government, but he never did. Uh, uh, he always hoped that he would win the wholehearted approval of the Senate, so he was good uh, in terms of his stewardship with his armies. Of course, he never could win the support of the Senate because the Senate didn't like him. He was too ambitious, and he wasn't one of them. In 60 BC, 60 BC, Pompey held the largest command that any Roman had ever held. After the war, he wanted the Senate to pass an enormous land grant in order to give land to his soldiers, his client army. The Senate balked. In order to get his grant, Pompey would need to get a consul elected to help him. The Senate wanted to have no part of this enormous grant of land uh, at this point in time, and so Pompey needed to get a consul elected who would support him in giving goodies to his client army. Uh, to achieve his ends, Pompey created an informal political alliance called the First Triumvirate. The First Triumvirate. Well, what does he need to get a consul in office who'll do what he wants done? First, he needs a, 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 a suitable candidate for consul. But secondly, he needs enough money to buy enough votes so that he can put that man in office. Well, for the money, he turned to the richest man in Rome, a fellow by the name of Marcus Licinius Crassus. Crassus was wealthy beyond the dreams of even the wealthiest Romans, uh, but he wanted something. Crassus had never commanded troops in a foreign war. And what Crassus really wanted was a great triumph, the, the glory of defeating Rome's enemies in war. And so he was willing to spend his money to get a consul into power who would give him a command. Uh, for his candidate for consul, Pompey chose a fellow by the name of Gaius Julius Caesar. Now, Caesar came from a very distinguished Roman patrician family, uh, but, but the, they're called the Julian family, but, but the Julian family had sort of fallen on hard times recently. 
Uh, there had not been a consul from the family in several generations. Julius Caesar wanted a consulship to, to bring back the prestige of his family and also to serve his own ambitions. Uh, they formed this sort of loose relationship called the First Triumvirate. They, the, uh, Pompey and Crassus were able to get Caesar elected. As consul, Caesar in the year 59 BC, Caesar got Pompey's soldiers their bonuses. Caesar got Crassus a command. Uh, Crassus, poor Crassus, went off to Asia and fought in a war and got himself defeated and killed in 53 BC, but at least he had his shot, at least he had his command. After his year as consul, Caesar received the proconsulship. Remember, this is a, go a governor position or a military position after your year in office. He was made the governor of Roman Gaul. Uh, Gaul is, was originally a small province in southern France. Uh, Caesar went to Gaul in 58, and he would serve there for nine years from 58 to 50 BC. Once he got to Gaul, he provoked a series of wars with his barbarian neighbors, uh, expanding, defeating them, and expanding the borders of the province of Gaul until it was an enormous province. It covered what today would be modern France and part of Germany all the way to the Rhine River, a huge province. In 49 BC, the Senate began to worry about the power of Caesar. As Caesar expanded, he brought Gauls, into Celtic peoples called Gauls, into his army, and he grew legion after legion after legion until Caesar's army was larger than the army that Rome had at its disposal. Uh, in 49 BC, the Senate recalled Caesar. They wanted to bring him back to Rome and they really wanted to punish him for his ambition. Caesar decided rather than come back to Rome alone as he was supposed to, leaving his army in Gaul, Caesar decided to invade Italy with his army intact and this began a civil war between the forces of Caesar and the forces of the Senate that would last from 49 to 45 BC. In this war, Pompey was killed. A number of other important leaders in the Senate were killed. And by 45 BC, Caesar had become the master of the entire Roman state. Caesar made himself dictator for life and he might have even restored the monarchy if he had had a chance. Uh, he was certainly in the position to do so. Most of his opponents were dead. Uh, he had the support of the whole army. But before he could go very far with his reforms, he was assassinated in 44 BC by a small group of nobiles, ironically, who he had spared after the war. Caesar was dead in 44 BC, and various other leaders began to struggle to regain the place that Caesar had left. There were two more civil wars from 44 to 30 BC. After his death, three of the remaining people who were in power, uh, Mark Anthony, his second in command, Octavian, Caesar's grand nephew, and Lepidus, the uh, Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of Rome, formed a another triumvirate called the, the uh, 
the second triumvirate, in order to rule Rome. Uh, they, they, would, they would continue to control Rome by means of this organization, this second triumvirate, uh, from 43 B.C. down to 33 B.C. Unlike the somewhat more famous first triumvirate, the second triumvirate was an official organ of the Roman state, an official institution, even though it wasn't constitutional, of the Roman state. The most important of the members of the second triumvirate were Julius Caesar's grand nephew and adopted son and heir, Octavian, and Caesar's closest friend and second in command, Mark Anthony. Uh, Anthony was sent to Egypt to consolidate Roman control of the East while Octavian stayed in Rome. In order to seal their alliance, Mark Anthony married Octavian's sister, Octavia. This, this was frequently done to seal political alliances. Well, once Anthony arrived in Egypt, he met Cleopatra. Now, Cleopatra, for some time, had been Julius Caesar's girlfriend. Uh, she had borne two sons by Caesar. And when, Octavian, when, when Anthony met Cleopatra, they began a love affair that I suggest was as much political as it was uh, emotional, and uh, they would have children together too. Octavian stayed in Rome. He was a master of propaganda. Every day he would go before the Roman Senate and talk about some new outrage that Anthony committed in Egypt. Anthony, he said, was going native, was beginning to talk like an Egyptian and dress like an Egyptian and engage in un-Roman Egyptian behavior. We can assume he was even walking like an Egyptian. And poor Octavia, who really never could stand Anthony, wandered the streets of Rome saying, Oh, woe is me, my husband have, has left me for this Egyptian strumpet. So, so, so Octavian, back in Rome, is playing Anthony for every bit he can get, is using Anthony as a, a sort of a propaganda prop in order to get more power, more influence over the Roman Senate. Well, finally, Mark Anthony began to realize that in order to reestablish his power, Mark Anthony's power, over Rome, he would have to invade Rome. And Cleopatra wanted to help him with this invasion because she wanted her sons by Julius Caesar to attain power at some point. Octavian and Cleopatra's forces sailed from Egypt to Italy, but they were decisively defeated on September 31st off the coast of Greece in a battle called the Battle of Actium. Both Anthony and Cleopatra committed suicide, and Octavian personally took control of Egypt as a, as a result of his his uh, victory over Anthony and Cleopatra. With the complete defeat of Anthony, Lepidus left the triumvirate and Octavian became the sole master, last man standing, as it were, sole master of the Roman world. Octavian would become the first Roman Emperor called Augustus Caesar. Octavian and Augustus are the same person. Augustus Caesar was the most important man in Roman history. He maintained control over the Roman state 
for the rest of his life, a period of 43 years from 30 B.C. down to A.D. 14. During this 43 years, he completely reorganized the Roman government to give permanent control to one man. He was the first Roman emperor. Augustus used military power to put himself in charge uh, of the old city-state government of Rome. He gained control by very skillfully combining the many powers of the old magistrates, the old elected officials, the consuls, the tribunes, the praetors, the, the censors, the old important officials of the Roman state. He transformed this power into an unofficial role of what we might call first citizen. Now, I should explain here, Augustus realized that if he made himself dictator for life, if he acquired almost kingly power, if he ruled Rome as a tyrant as Julius Caesar had done, his life expectancy would be pretty low. He wouldn't live very long. So Augustus had to create essentially an informal, unobtrusive kind of power. He had to be the man behind the curtain. He had to be the guy that pulls all the strings but doesn't have a huge amount of formal power because if he did, he would probably be assassinated. The Romans didn't like tyrants and kings, so what Augustus has to do is walk a very fine line between tyranny and not being able to do anything. And so let's talk a little bit about, about how he manages to achieve this. In many years, especially the first five years, he served as one of the consuls himself. And he got the Senate and Assembly to give him the power of a consul even in those years where he didn't actually serve as a consul. In essence, there continued to be two regular consuls elected every year, but Augustus was always there as a sort of a third consul. And Augustus's authority, his prestige was so great that no elected consul would ever argue with him. Uh, he was also given the power of a tribune. Now, Augustus could never hold the tribuneship because he was a patrician. He came from a patrician family. And so, since he couldn't be given the office, the Senate voted him the powers of a tribune for life. But why did he want the powers of a tribune? There are, there are two, two reasons here. The first one is, remember, the body of a tribune is sacred. Nobody can assassinate or harm a tribune while he's in office. And since uh, Augustus had the power of a tribune for life, he would always essentially be in office. The second thing that a tribune has is he has the power to veto. He can forbid any action. And so Augustus, although he almost never used it, now has the tribunician power to forbid action in the Senate, action in the Assembly, to forbid action that might go against his power, his interests. Uh, he also acquired the powers of a censor, and the censorial power allowed him to decide who could be in the Senate and who would not be in the Senate. All of these measures, all of these powers, if you will, gave Augustus control over the Roman government in Italy, but it also was necessary for him to control the provinces, the areas outside of Italy. Uh, and, and so uh, Augustus reformed the army 
and he reformed the way that provinces in the empire were controlled. Now traditionally, the Senate had chosen governors to go out to the provinces, uh, but Augustus had the Senate divide the provinces into two different groups. Some provinces were pacified, <coughs> they were at peace, they were prosperous, they didn't really need an army, and so Augustus allowed the Senate to keep those provinces and elect proconsuls, governors, to go out to those provinces. Now, some provinces uh, were on the edges of the empire. They, they still needed soldiers to run them. They still required uh, an army, a substantial army, to defend these provinces. These provinces Augustus kept for himself. He made himself the permanent proconsul of these, if you will, dangerous provinces. And he, uh, this is where the bulk of the army was. And Augustus would then select representatives to go out to his provinces, and, and they're called legates. They would govern the provinces in his name. So the easy provinces, the old provinces where you don't need a lot of soldiers, where you don't need a big army, the Senate got to keep them. And they could use them to send out governors who could enhance their reputations and, and gain prestige from governing a province, but they wouldn't have a very big army. They couldn't make trouble. The provinces that needed a lot of soldiers, the ones on the outside, the periphery of the empire, Augustus sent his own representatives out with large armies to make sure that these provinces were peaceful, to keep any barbarians out, and these soldiers served Augustus, directly served Augustus, even though it was through a representative, an agent of Augustus called a legate. The most important office that Augustus held really wasn't an office at all. Uh, it was a, an informal title that was given to the oldest member of the Senate. And this title is called the Princeps, P-R-I-N-C-E-P-S, Senatus, the principal member of the Senate. We might call it the title First Citizen. Now, Augustus was given this title uh, around 17 BC, and it, it, it really doesn't carry a lot of power. It's not as powerful as, say, imperator, which means general, which is where we get the word emperor. Uh, it, it, the, the, the only thing it entails is the right to speak first in every session of the Senate. Uh, back before Augustus, the oldest member of the Senate would, would walk into the Senate and he would, the, all the senators would stand up out of respect to Augustus and the, the, the princep senatus would look around the room and nod and say, ah, there's a funny smell out in the forum today. And having made his utterance, he would sit down and then the sit-in would get to the business of the day. Doesn't seem like much of, a, much of a power, doesn't seem like a very prestigious position, but Augustus loved it. It was really in many ways perfect. It commanded enormous respect and it allowed Augustus to speak first every morning when the Senate met. Now, what Augustus could do with this power is set the agenda for the day. If Augustus came out and all the senators rose and sat back down and Augustus said, there's a real problem with piracy in the eastern Mediterranean, the eastern part of our empire, 
Well, you can bet what the Senate would discuss that day and do something about is piracy in the Eastern Mediterranean. So this, this, this sort of informal title, Princeps Senatus, would become a means by which Augustus could control the Senate without appearing to have too much power. He could say, all I am is another citizen. I have a little more respect. I have a little greater prestige. I have more money than anybody else. But all I am is just another citizen. The Republic is restored. Of course, the truth of the matter is that Augustus used the powers that he had from official offices, used the, the power of the first citizen to control the entire Roman state and the entire Roman Empire. But it was a, a, an informal series of positions which placed him in effect in a position to be able to say, I'm no more important than any other Roman citizen. The Republic is working and we have saved and restored the old Republican values of the Roman Empire. Of course, none of that's true. In practice, the Roman government had, had wasn't worth restoring. The Roman government had never really been very democratic. It had been dominated by a few highly placed, important, and distinguished families. And let's face it, they had done a dreadful job of controlling and governing both Rome and Italy and even the provinces. Uh, in city-state government, the, well, Rome, the, the city-state government the old early Republican government had failed. So what Augustus does in essence is he creates a government that watches over the Roman state even while the Senate and people can proclaim that they're in power. And this is the beginning of the Roman Empire. It starts in 30 BC when Augustus defeats uh, uh, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, it will continue for hundreds of years. It will become the most famous, the greatest empire in the world. And as we're going to see next time, good emperors who follow in Augustus' footsteps emperors who don't call too much attention to themselves, emperors who operate, as it were, behind the curtain. And bad emperors will be emperors who attempt to use their power too flagrantly, too obviously, emperors who persecute the Senate, emperors who decide that they will have royal or dictatorial powers. And those emperors, those bad emperors, as we'll see next time, will usually fairly quickly become dead emperors. So next time, we're going to take a look at how the Roman Empire works. Okay, well, we've learned about the late Republic. When we come back for our next lecture, we'll find out more information, again, still with Rome concerning the early empire. I had stated that the Republic um, is no more. We're going to have an empire rise in Rome. Until next time.